public speaking, but I'm sure that many people will say when they do a courses or teach you about public speaking, never start a talk with a joke. Don't use a joke to start. But the problem here is that my story, the story I'm going to tell you, really started with a joke. Um, it was uh, almost nine years ago, and um, my girlfriend uh, at the time, and now she's my wife, and she was organizing a, a project in Africa with, with clowns without borders. So I remember say, she was very excited about the project, and she was talking to me, explaining the project, and I said, hey, if you are going to Africa with, video, with games without borders, I come with video games without borders. <laughs> Uh, and that's how everything started. Everything started with that joke. The, the name came from there. You know about you know the Doctors Without Borders and all the Without Borders NGOs. And that's how we started. And how, that's how also I ended up in Africa uh, doing a um, workshop with uh, local people and try to develop a game with them. But that's, that's a long story. So let's start what we're talking about today. First of all, with a game without borders. We are a, no, a global community and a non-profit organization. So we are both of them. And the community is, is really international. We are more than 300 people in 30 countries. And uh, we use Slack as our main platform for um, the community. But we are now transitioning to Discord. So it's a bit, uh, we are a bit in a mixed situation right now. And as I said, we are a non-profit organization. We are registered in Spain. The official name is in Spanish, is Videojuegos Sin Fronteras. And we really believe in the power of digital games to change the world for better. And when we say change the world for better, we use the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as our uh, frame of action, as our guidelines for what it means a good cause, what it means really making good the world. So we really believe games can be used in any one of these 17 big areas. So we could make a game about education or health, but we can also do it about gender equality, climate change, sustainable development, peace, anything you can imagine, anything that is in the roadmap for humanity, signed by all the countries in the United Nations, we really believe digital games can help. And uh, how can video games help? First of all, we believe games can be used to have a direct impact on quality of life, improving the quality of life of people. In this case, we are talking mainly about education and health, but it could be applied to other subjects as well. Then, video game market is a very big market. It's a rich market. I mean, it's bigger than cinema or uh, music, so we could use commercial games to do fundraising. So running a campaign, this is mainly successful if you do it within a successful game, obviously, when you have a big install base, a big base of players uh, that you can address to. Uh, but also, it's a very powerful media. Games are, are, are a media of the 21st century. So that's why we believe we can run a campaign within a game or with a game, and we can use it to raise awareness change the perception, change the, 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 the behavior, in some cases, of, of the people. And this is really the third, uh, let's say, way in which video game can help. And uh, we believe that the video games we do can have a big impact, but we also believe that the way we develop our games has as much importance as the game themselves. So that's why in our project, all the, mm, pr all the teams are international, and we always try to involve people from developing country. At the same time, we try to promote the integration of new talents in the games industry, and we are talking about students, but we are also talking about uh, diversity, having all kinds of collective groups involved in, in the development, or in the project in a way or another. I mean, when we say about development, it's pretty big, but we do have translators, we do have marketers, we have... We, it's not only coding, what we are doing. And anyway, games is not only about, game, about coding, it's about code, art, design, audio. There are very lot, lot of specialization within the game development. And uh, why we are here at the Open South Code? Well, because 
all of our game or most of our games are open. And that's what we try to do. We really believe that having the work we do, making it available as open, both the code and the assets, is really key. And we use GitHub as the repository in which you can find all these things. Why, why open? Why do we think that making open games can have such a mm, positive impact? I mean, first of all, it's part of the collective knowledge. We are helping everybody getting access to all this, this code and assets so they can be reused and it can be um, uh, part of this common progress we are doing little by little. On the other side, it allows us for incremental development, no matter which the client or the founder is. Imagine, uh, we'll see in a minute, some of our project, but uh, one of them it was the initially developed for Syrian refugees. And then after, we had a discussion with the Ministry of Education in Uruguay. So we were able to take the work done for senior refugees and adapt it for children in public school in Uruguay. And then the same work was done then to help Ukrainian children. So if each project was property or locked, uh, blocked in a way or another as a, with some sort of ownership or uh, limitation to the specific founders or specific client we had, we could not do this incremental uh, development, making each project build on previous one, making it, that, uh, uh, making it effective, but also making it the, all the development available for a broader audience. And then, uh, I mean, we are a non-profit organization. We was founded in 2015, so we just celebrated our eight, eighth anniversary. But uh, maybe Video Game Without Borders will not be there forever. So the project, we want our project to survive, to live longer than the organization itself. Since the code and the assets are there, are available for anybody, this will allow anybody to, to, to get that and keep uh, evolving it, keep building on them. And the uh, last point is quite obvious, but uh, sometimes we are obliged to, no matter if we want it or not. Uh, as I said, we will see in a minute the project for Syrian refugees. It was organized by a Norwegian, let's say, agency for international cooperation, sort of the part of the Ministry for International Affairs, and with a lot of partners. But it was part of the competition, part of the requirement. I mean, everything you do must be open source, must be distributed. So this is something that is really interesting because especially public entities, uh, organization, institution, they are really focusing more and more on having uh, both the code open source and the assets as a creative common. Uh, if anything is founded with public money, it should be open, it should be free for anybody to build on this later on. Um, let's talk about projects. This is the project I was talking uh, before. Um, it's called Antura and the Letters, and uh, it's a mobile app. You can download it on your phone. And um, it's completely free, obviously. <laughs> uh, it, it's about the literacy and languages. But everything started in 2016 when the refugee crisis from Syria coming to Europe was at the peak. And there were more than 2 million children out of school or not having access to a quality of education. So as I said, the Norwegian government with international partners organized an international competition, a call for innovation called EduApp for Syria. And the goal was develop, uh, in fact, what they did was analyzing the market, the need, and they realized there were so many kids out of school and there were so many kids that since the war was so long as well in, uh, in Syria, the challenge was that there were kids who have maybe 10 years old, 11 years old, and have never been to school. So we were, risking to lose a complete generation in their literacy, meaning having a full generation of Syrian children could not read uh, proficiently in their mother language. And, um, and so they organized this call for innovation and uh, they, they challenged uh, innovators from all around the world to come with solution to offer a, a, a gamified or a gaming, uh, um, a ludic experience that allow kids to learn to read in their mother language. Arabic, 
and at the same time to um, help children improve their psychosocial well-being. So like we are focusing on literacy, but we are always often, we are often forgetting the power of games on our health, especially on our mental health, psychological health. So we started with Syrians, with uh, literacy, as I said, and I can assure you, I don't know, is anybody here speaking Arabic? No, well, Arabic is pretty complex. You are from uh, Israel, so it's not the same. It's much simpler Hebrew than, <laughs> than Arabic. You know, just for you to understand, you see it on the right. This let the one you see, the four the drawing there, they are exactly the same letter. Just depending if it is alone at the beginning, in the center, or at the end of the word. I don't speak Arabic, but I learned a lot during the development. So Arabic is a very complicated language, and uh, so it allows us to develop a system that really fits for almost any language in the world that is based on alphabet. So it's, it's based on alphabet, so like ideograms kind of languages, we don't support them, but any language that is all European languages, Hebrew, most of the, most of the languages of the world, in fact, they are based on, 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 on an alphabet. And, um, and then we adapted, this was, this was started in 2016, it was uh, developed during 2017, and, uh, and finally released in 2018. And 2019, we, we identified another crisis that was key for us, and it was Afghanistan. Um, and we are talking 2019, so like a couple of years before the Taliban got back in power just to get you understanding of the situation. We found some partners in the region because we never do project alone. We are mainly game developers, so we are not expert on humanitarian field, we may not be expert on literacy or on the language themselves. Uh, so we always look for partners that are really active in the region and we, both for the content, to be sure that the content is really appropriate for the, the, the audience, but also for being sure that we can have a strong partner, local partner for distribution and communication. And so we, we expanded to Afghanistan, we received awards uh, for UNHCR for this project, the first grant, and then went, but the project was a bit stuck also because COVID arrived, so the project got a bit in standby. After uh, the Taliban got him back in power, the Afghanistan situation got international attention again, and at that time we were able to find a sponsor to, to, um, to, to keep, uh, to uh, restore, to relieve the, this project and, and finalize it. And in, the case, in this case, the, the, the sponsor was Ubisoft, a major video game developer. I, I'm, I've been working with them for 15 years, so I know them very well. And, um, and then, while we were working for the Afghans, the Ukrainian war started almost uh, just a bit more than one year ago. And the situation was a bit different in this case because the challenge was not so much on literacy, but we had some millions of families moving from Ukraine to other countries, mainly European countries. And uh, so the challenge there was in, on the integration. And so we, in the meantime, we had already experimented using the system to learn a foreign language. So we adapted this system for helping Ukrainians. Uh, as you can see, we are always building on what's happening. So we made a game for Syrians in Arabic, we adapted it to learn English for the Uruguayan, Ur Uruguay, Uruguayan public school, for learning English in, uh, for primary school kids, and then this system was then adapted to help uh, Ukrainians. It's still building on each iteration, one after the other. So we now support eight European languages. These are, these are the one you can see on the screen. And, um, and we have, I think the game now supports up to 12 native language. So because you can learn those, uh, have an introduction. I mean, we're talking about kids game, but um, the, in this, you can learn these eight languages, but it support uh, Ukrainian, it support Russian, uh, it support uh, Arabic for sure, and uh, 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 the Afghan languages as well. And it works. That's the other key part, part of it. Uh, thanks to the big project that it was done at the beginning for Syrian refugees, uh, it was tested by professional independent, an independent evaluation in Azraq refugee camp in Jordan, and it was uh, proven that it's working both on literacy, I did not put it in the slide, but it's also working in some way, surprisingly, it's working even better for the psychosocial well-being of the kids. So the, the kids are really improving their well-being simply by playing a game, a few hours uh, a day. 
is you know, no, no, a few hours a week, not not so much a day. And um, and it's a, it's a quality game. That what we are doing, I mean, we are. That's a one thing you want. It's not a simple gamified educational app. It's really a 3D game in which you play with. You have the dog that is Antura that gives the name to the to the product, and you have this character, this white character that are letters, which you play with. And you have a collection of mini games. So you can customize the dog as much as you want, and you go through different six different worlds while you learn. It's uh, several hours of play. I mean, it could be 10 to 15 hours of play for the full game. And you learn all the alphabet, all the variation of the letter with their sound. In, in Arabic, apart from writing in different ways, you also have different accents that are short vowels. So the same letter, like let, let's say the letter B, like B, it can sound B, Ba, or Bu, depending on which accent you put on it. It's pretty complicated, the system. And it works, it's successful. I mean, we have more than 300, 350,000 downloads so far with very positive feedback from the players. And we received uh, several international awards and nomination. Um, so we are really proud of this game. It's our first game. And in some way, it was a very special case because we were able to get big funding at the beginning to build the foundation of the project and then expand it with little funding, little by little. Uh, we also think we can do different kind of game, much smaller ones. And this is an example. In beginning of 2020, we had uh, the, the COVID striking uh, all around the world. And suddenly we were working on something. Everything was changing in the world. We were in lockdown. And uh, so we decided, we, what can we do? So then we talked with the community and with a team of volunteers with no budget. We didn't spend one euro. I think, no, we, we only, the only money we spent was to register the website. <laughs> That's the only money we spent and, uh, on the project. And it was done in, in six weeks, the game with volunteers. Some of them, they had never done a game before. So it was, I was blown away by the experience. I could not, I do not believe I could be possible at the time. And uh, I don't think it's uh, repeatable, honestly. I, uh, I think that uh, to really make a game with volunteers, you need a budget anyway, because you need a core team that is committed to the project and you're sure that you are, you are able to deliver on quality and on time. And um, the, co the game is called Flatten Island because you remember, I mean, I'm sure everybody remember about the, the COVID and the curve and you, the, there was all these things about flatten the curve being sure that we don't have an exponential number of cases, and so on. So it's a simple game, in, inspired by other successful games that are on the market, and each day you, have, you are the ruler of a small island, that is called Flatten Island, and you have the different advisors. So every day you present an advisor comes to you, you choose which one to listen to, and then you take a simple decision, A or B. There's an, as simple as that, and this has an impact on several, several parameters you have, the amount of money you have, the happiness of the people, the number of cases, so the number of people in hospitals, and how much you progress with the vaccine on, on the top. So the goal is really to discover the vaccine to be able to end the, um, the pandemic. Uh, this game is available only on Android and web. That's because Apple did not allow to be published on, uh, on the App Store. At the time, there were a mm, lot of apps coming out about COVID and pandemic and so on, so they had to, to apply very strict policy on what to be published. We tried to convince them it was not possible, that it, <laughs> it, uh, so we could not publish it for, for iOS in this case. But you can, even on, uh, with an, an iPhone, you can play it on the web on uh, uh, itch.io. And uh, more recently, we started uh, exploring different fields. It's, uh, it's doing projects with a European Union funding. So these are sort of research projects, prototyping for uh, training and education. It's called Erasmus Plus. It's, uh, it's a line of funding from the European Union. As you can see, it seems very academic. The title is Increasing and Announcing Effective Digital Opportunity for Refugees and Migrants. It's not really a commercial title. Um, and uh, in this case, the idea of the, the app is uh, it's available, it's, it's open source and available completely, and you can do it on, on your phone. But it's a sort of a personal assistant for a refugee that is going through the integration process in a country. But it's designed to be used in 
um, as a complement for a, a coaching session for the refugee, we are talking about adult refugees in this case, with a, a coach that is following in with day, uh, weekly or bi-weekly meetings and sessions. So it's not a standalone game, it's more a personal assistant companion app that you can use to set your goals, you have these cards, you, you set your own goals to keep progressing in your task for the integration, you have a sort of an assessment of how good you are performing uh, in the in different uh, fields of the, uh, the integration, there are these pillars, and then every time you complete a card, the card goes to the pillars and the pillars grows. But we have the integrated a, a set of mini games that are specifically designed to help you develop some skills that are we think it would be beneficial for the resilience when you enter the, mar the, the, the job market as soon as you are completed the integration process. It's a, it's a project that we are finalizing in a few weeks, so the result will be published during the summer. Uh, as I said, it's a prototype. You can see also the graphic is not so much work and so on. We are really focusing on prototyping and testing if the system is fine. And it's done with partners from all around Europe, so we will test it. We are currently testing it with, ref with 200 refugees in the UK. UK was still in Europe, part of Europe when we started, the project started, uh, it was the last one, um, in Greece and in Sweden and in Germany. So that's where we are testing it right now. And this is the last project uh, we are working on. It's still in beta. Um, it's available for mobile phones and for web. And it's developed in collaboration with uh, Diputación Provincial de Málaga, meaning the, the owner of this building, <laughs> even if it's uh, in collaboration with La Noria, that is a, a social uh, center for uh, uh, social innovation, like a social hub. Um, it's uh, close to the where the football stadium is. If you know the, if you don't know well the city, um, it's a it's a center that is fo uh, focusing on uh, fostering, promoting social innovation in different fields. And the challenge there was they were celebrating this year the 10th anniversary, and they wanted a different tool to talk, especially with young people, but also to all kinds of practitioners. They are collaborating, visiting the center, or mm, doing any kind of collaboration with them. Instead of coming and presenting a few slides to explain what the, the center do, what kind of work they do, the idea is that you play a challenging puzzle game. It's challenging. I recommend you to download and play. And um, each one, you see, you have these cards on the bottom part that are hexagons, pieces, several hexagons put in together, and you have to fit them on the, on the, on the map of Malaga. That's the, the map. Um, the, the Diputación, they are, I mean, the, the province, they are focusing on all the villages with less than 20,000 um, people. So they are not really working in the city, even if they do have buildings and uh, you know they do have some uh, activities here, but they are, their services are mainly focusing towards smaller, smaller villages. So the, 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 the area of the province is divided into eight counties, and you have to fill all the province with these projects that are real projects developing during the 10 years of uh, existence of the, of the um, center. And at the same time, you learn about the social impact. They are really focusing on four lines that are um, environment and climate change, um, like equality, meaning you know different uh, sort of gender equality, but also the all type of uh, um, collective people groups that are maybe the needing special support. They have technology for people, and they have uh, demographic demographic challenge. Because, uh, as you know, in Spain, we talk a lot about the La España vaciada, the empty Spain, or that is, uh, people are moving a lot from the villages to the cities, leaving a lot of the rural areas empty. So they are trying to offer content, innovation, to bring people to the, the villages. And in the end, you have your own social impact. This is a good score if you want to play. This is a challenge. If you get to, to 1,200, it's a good score. Uh, and, um, and at the same time, you can discover a lot of the projects they have been developing in these 10 years, because each one of the cards is it's a project, and you have all the details about the project themselves. And as I said, we are still in beta, but since we were presenting here today, last night we, we launched a new feature. It's still bugged, but it's working. It's, there's some bug, so uh, 
we have now an online leaderboard, the one you see on the left. So if you download the game and you try to play, please check where you get in there. Uh, we would like to really to have more and more people to play and to get to a good score and see how uh, you can see how you, you compare to others who have been playing the game. And if you have any comment about the game, as I said, we are still in development, let us know. I mean, we are pretty happy with the result, uh, the result of the game, considering that it's a pretty small project. But uh, as I said, we are still in development and it, I think will be for a few more weeks. Uh, that's about our project. Um, all of them are open source and you can find all of them on GitHub. So in fact, if you go on GitHub on uh, VGWB, page, video game without borders page, you will find the code, the assets. In example, for Antura, that is the biggest project with a 3D character, 3D environment, animation, you can also, have, you have a dedicated uh, repository for assets. Uh, you have some documentation. For the European project, the AIDO project, we also developed a, a specific training module for coaches about digital game-based learning. So you have it in the docs, there's a link to our site where you can get it. Uh, all our projects are developed in Unity. Unity is not open source. Uh, Unity is a commercial engine. I think tomorrow morning you will have a talk about uh, a, a Godot, uh, that is a new emerging uh, engine uh, open source, uh, game engine. But um, at the time we started it was not available, and at the time we decided to keep working on Unity because we have usually a very limited time and very limited resources. And most of the professionals who work with us on the project are really expert in Unity. So we want to take best advantage of their time to be sure that they don't have to spend time learning new things and they just can apply their things. Imagine if you want to uh, an artist is used to work uh, or she's used to work on Photoshop. Yeah, we have GIMP, but you know, if if they, are, if they are very pro proficient in Photoshop, you pref I prefer them to have them working with it. It's a challenge, it's a transition that will take some time. Uh, sometimes we are able to use Blender for 3D, but in other cases we have been using Max or Maya, so Autodesk solution. So we, we are not very strict on everything we use to make our game. A anyway, a, a good point about Unity is that even if it's a commercial engine, there is a, a personal version of it that is completely free. So for less than $100,000 uh, $100, per year, you, you can use it for free for your project. And uh, I, put, I included modules on the left because I wanted to make a specific mention about the, um, the project we do. So the code we write is usually open source, uh, but we sometimes we need specific code from others. An example, we are making a game about Arabic. Uh, there are already other people who have been working on right to left writing, how the Arabic letter connects that are, you know, like handwritten, so they connect or not connect depending on each letter, so, and uh, many other features like that. So we just look for open source modules we can find on, uh, on the web or on different on GitHub or, where, or, or even on, uh, on the Unity Asset Store and then we integrate in our project. In some cases, we were able to improve them and then keep distributing it. But we, so far, we did never distributed our own modules, but we want to. And we plan to do it by the end of this year, beginning of next year. So we identified that developing our games, we have developed already sort of simple modules for the notification on mobile, the, I don't know, the leaderboard. Um, so, S very limited uh, specific modules that, uh, especially code, that we can isolate and uh, make it independent from the rest of the project as extract and distribute it as an open source module for other developers. So this is part of what we are doing uh, in the coming weeks and months. So we hope soon we will be able to have both on GitHub and on the Unity Asset Store to be you, you guys to be able to find those modules and use it for your own projects. Anyway, all the code is there. So uh, you can look into how we have been developing anyway. Yeah, no matter how, uh, just look at it and uh, you can get in, inside the, um, the, the repository on GitHub. 
So we have been working with open source for a while now, and I wanted to sort of share our experience. A as you see, I mean, um, I mean, I was a programmer a long time ago, but I don't program anymore, so I don't go much into technical detail. I'm more pro offering a, an overall vision about how we make games open and how do we use open source in our games. So which are the pros and cons we identified of working with um, open source solutions uh, for our games? Well, first of all, as I was mentioning before, it's very efficient in terms of long-term cost-wise. I mean, uh, just to make an example, the Antura project was initially funded, uh, I mean, for development, we had more, the more than 300,000 euros uh, for the initial development. Overall project was uh, half a million, but only for development, including the testing uh, and so on, and communication. But the development was 300,000. Uh, after that, we were able to make a game for uh, learning English, adapting the solution we created, learning English for uh, the public school in Uruguay for one-tenth of the budget, for 30K. And then, progressing and progressing, we can really be, be cost-efficient in the long run. But on the other side, if you want the code to be clean, to be readable, to be well-documented, then it's a bit less effective in the short term. Because every time you do something new, you have to be careful about doing it properly, being, be reusable, be well documented, and so on. So there is a little bit overhead in the short term. We consider our project as a learning opportunity for everybody, meaning that, as I was mentioning, you can get the code and look into it. If you are, want to learn about Unity development, you have a lot of material out there, but I'm not sure how much you can find a full project with a successful project like Antura, uh, that is quite big with 3D animation, characters, lighting, uh, uh, you know, different scenes and different challenges. Uh, and you can look in how it was developed little by little. Um, and <coughs> I mean, the, the pros, as, as I mentioned, there's a bit of overhead, but for sure the code is more readable and more documented. On the other side, since we are, um, we are we want to our, distribute our project as open source, we cannot use any component that is not open source. So sometimes it's a limitation because you really want to have a specific feature and there is no open source solution for it. Or that you want to have some specific assets that are not open source. We tried sometimes to get it uh, you know, in independent, keep it independent. So if you want to, just to make an example, at the beginning of the, uh, no, the first release of the Antura game, we were using a commercial uh, plugin for rendering of the text, text because it, with the supporting the Arabic, with all the connection, with all the right to left and so on, was pretty complicated. Uh, since the project has been going on for long, Unity bought the solution, integrated into Unity. So now it's part of Unity, so it, we don't need to, you don't need to purchase any more any license to use this, this uh, element. So this has happened more than once. So, but still, it limits a bit the opportunity you may have uh, in doing things. And the last point is, seems silly, but I mean, we have a 3D game that is quite successful with a nice character, and it's completely open. Anybody can get it, can use it, also for commercial purposes. Uh, it was part of the, the requirements from the initial competition. So you can get it, republish it, and rename it, or republish it uh, as you want, and uh, you can sell it and become rich out of our work. We, will not, we don't have the right to have uh, one euro out of your uh, sales. Uh, we don't see it as a big risk. We think it's worth the effort and so on, but it's something you have to take into account if you're going fully open source. And there is one more comment I wanted on this is, not everything can be, um, not everything can be open. Just to make it, sometimes you have a client that have his proprietary solution. Just to make an example, we adapted the Antura game to be used in a classroom for Pro Futuro Foundation. In Spain, it could be quite famous because it's mixed between Telefonica Foundation and La Caixa Foundation. And so, it, it's an initiative, the uh, joint initiative between uh, Telefonica Foundation and La Caixa Foundation, focusing on education. And they do have a solution where they, they train teachers, they give a, 
um, a suite case with a PC for the teacher, tablets for the kids, uh, and they distribute it in developing countries, and they wanted to have something for Lebanon, in this case, for, you know, for Syrians. So we adapted the solution to be interacting with their solution, communicating with the PC and so on, but it's their proprietary system. So this project could not be distributed open source. Not even the documentation. No, uh, uh, we are still negotiating with them to be able to make it public, but even the guidelines for the teacher of how to use Antura in the classroom, it's their property because it was, it's the client, they paid for it, and they have the rights. So um, it really depends. In some most of the cases, as I said, especially the um, uh, the public institution, they are op they are open or they are required to be open, but uh, not it's not always the case. So you may not be able to make everything open, even if you want to. And that's it. That's our motto. We believe in games, and uh, I hope. I presented a bit about what uh, you understand a bit what we do and uh, how we do it. So I would like now to listen a bit more to you. You can ask in Spanish or English as you prefer. Wait. Thank you. Any question? On my side, I really stress on this. Download Voya La Noria, this one, and play. It's really fun. It's really fun, and it's, it's 20 minutes to, for, a, for a game. You don't need much time, and you will see you will get engaged soon. No question? Can I ask one question, <laughs> if nobody has a question? What were you expecting from the talk? I mean, did I... Uh, answer what you were expecting, you were expecting something different. Thank you. Are anybody of you working with Unity or working with games, interested in making games? Okay, cool. Uh, one, one thing that maybe I forgot to mention, I mean, we are a community, so this is, a, uh, this is our contact. If you are interested to join the community to collaborate with us, let me know. I mean, we are a very small NGO, so everything you send to, it comes to me, so it will be very simple. Uh, we don't have employees, we are working as a community, so uh, it will be pretty straightforward, don't, don't be afraid. Anything else? No, no, it's not normal. So, so the question is, how do we engage developers from the beginning or at the, at the beginning? So. The, the, the process was a bit try and error, so we just made several iterations. At the beginning, as I said, everything started with a joke. I went to Africa and I tried to make a game by myself with local people. It was a bit of a mess. We almost made it, but we couldn't make it uh, at all because I didn't know anybody in Burkina Faso when I went there, even if I stayed six months. Um, but then when I came back, I tried to formalize a bit better the vision for the organization and share it with my contact in the games industry. So there were people say, oh, that's interesting, let me know if I can help. Or there were other people, hey, you should talk with that other guy because he's, trying, he's interested in that same subject. So little by little, you start to identify the key people who are really more active, more interested. And in the end, it's really down to very few people who are really committed. So right now, most of the project, we are four people, let's say, that are the main core team. Uh, there are others. There are also sometimes people, they are very interested in collaborating, but depending on their professional situation. So maybe one is changing job and he has a few weeks that is free. So that was, okay, that's a good moment. I can help on a project. There are others who are more freelance. Most of our community are freelancers. 
or small studio, very small studio, so that easy for them to choose what to spend their time on. Um, but it, it, uh, I mean, it, it was a bit, it was not planned. It was sort of, uh, you know, sobre la marcha. I mean, like little by little, uh, step by step. In example, when we decided to apply for the International Call for Innovation of the initial Antura project, uh, it was a former colleague of mine who is now a professor at the German University. I forgot to mention the partners there. I mean, it's a Cologne Game Lab. It's a, it's a school for video games in Cologne. This one, the one on the bottom right, Cologne Game Lab. So he's a professor there. And uh, he contacted me, I mean, because he knew what I was doing because I was sharing through my contact. And he said, hey, we should apply together. I have some friend from Syria that could help us. And then, okay, but we need a prototype in two weeks. Because you had to apply. So, okay, I said, who is more motivated in the, in the community? I said, okay, Stefano in Italy. Okay, Stefano, do you have time? Mm, we need the prototype, a little, pro very little prototype in two weeks. Can we make it? Yes, we made it. We got selected because it was a quite interesting competition as well. Because uh, it was organized in a way that was quite challenging. I think they had 78 applications world, worldwide. And uh, they selected five. Uh, to be founded until, uh, they call it alpha, but it was more like a first playable, like a, a first iteration of the game in which you could really see the potential of the game. And then from there, they selected three, they found until beta, and then they said two winners, and they founded finalization, distribution, and field testing. So, I mean, I, it, it, was a, it was a challenge. It is a challenge, most of the cases. I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i quite used to work with an environment that, that is very dynamic. But when we had to apply, apart from not having a team, so you, I mean, we need a prototype in two weeks. But then you have three months of silence because they are evaluating all the, and then out of the sudden, hey, you got selected. We, you have three months to deliver the first label. OK, I don't have a team. I need to build a team from scratch. At the same time, hey, we are non-profit, it was just started as a like happy flower kind of uh, things. We don't have a bank account. We need to be able to manage all the accountancy, all the things. So we had to do all the paperwork, building a team, developing the project, and we still were able to get selected. So I mean, we are pretty happy about the results we were able to get, but it's a challenge. It is a challenge. Si. Si, perfecto. Yo he vivido seis meses en Burkina Faso, en, la en Burkina Faso, en la segunda ciudad del país que se llama Babo Diolaso. Eso es donde. Pero esa foto, la del inicio, es la, capi en la, es la capital. Eso es, en la, eso es un uh, Fab Lab. No sé si conocéis lo que son los Fab Labs. Es un centro. Eh, han construido ellos mismos, los chavales de ahí, el edificio con las técnicas tradicionales. De hecho, el segundo día tuvimos que parar porque había, estaba lloviendo muchísimo y había problemas con, con la puerta, no se podía entrar. Pero hicimos como, como si fuera una game jam, un poco reducida, con gente de ahí. El, el de la izquierda es un profesor de una escuela de, escuela de, mes, como de profesiones, como una formación profesional, podría ser un FP. Eh, los otros son más que nada estudiantes o jóvenes emprendedores locales e intentamos hacer proyectos con ellos usando videojuegos, siempre con impacto. Pero vamos, eh, ha sido una experiencia, eh, he aprendido mucho, pero es difícil, es como complicado. Sí. Absolutamente. Y, y para daros una idea, eh, en Bobo Diolaso, eh, de uni la universidad, no hay internet. De hecho, cuando eh, hice la broma de van, voy con videojuegos sin frontera a África, no sabían todavía en qué país iban. Estaban valorando varios países, con, clown without con payasos sin, sin frontera que son de Barcelona. Y mm, al final fue Burkina Faso y cuando dijo... Me surgió la duda, ¿hay internet en Burkina Faso? <risa> Miré y en esos índices que te salían a la época era el segundo país de los que aparecían, porque algunos que no aparecían, con el peor calidad de internet. Pero, pero se puede hacer. 
se puede desarrollar ahí. Yo me hice formaciones mismo, colaboré un poco con la universidad. Ha sido una buena experiencia, pero es verdad que muy lento, todo va muy lento. Y, y en tres o seis meses no fue posi posible terminar el juego. <risa>